Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out uh, for tonight's uh, Nights at the Round Table. Uh, tonight we have Shane Weeks. He's a tribe member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation and a tribal cultural consultant, uh, a longtime um, friend of the Water Mill Center uh, as a, uh, a community fellow now uh, that he serves as, and he's also uh, been here as an artist in residence. Um, and yeah, so a couple of things. We want to make sure that you have your uh, phones turned to silence or off. Um, and Shane has this beautiful display here on the table, but he's asked that no one touch that uh, or any of the, the items on the blanket. Um, I wanted to let you know about our other events that we have coming up for Nights at the Round Table. Uh, our next one is Wednesday, February 13th uh, with Ganu Benton. Um, and there's a wait list for that right now. As you can see, our, uh, we have a, these nights are pretty intimate, so we like to keep them that way. Um, and then our following and final uh, Nights at the Round Table event is with uh, one of our alumni, uh, Ryder Cooley on uh, February 30th, so we, and there's plenty of spots if you'd like to sign up for that. Uh, so without further ado, here's Shane. Uh, 
Hello, good evening. Uh, my name is Standing Buffalo. I am of the Buffalo clan. I'm an Anishinaabe man from Shinnecock. And uh, for those who may not know, Shinnecock is a um, local tribe here. Uh, we are the indigenous people of what was once um, our entire territory of Southampton. Um, our people have been documented here um, through archaeology uh, for 13, about 13,000 years, almost 14,000 years. Our people have been here, um, which is about the same time Long Island has been here. Um, Long Island was created by uh, Glacier. And when the glacier receded, this was the edge of when that glacier uh, receded backwards, back north. Um, so our people have a long history here in Southampton. Uh, we have been documented um, by the English um, since first contact. Uh, we consider ourselves what's known as a first contact tribe. And what that means is that when the settlers came here um, from Europe, first it was the Dutch and then the English, uh, we were amongst those first people that contacted those settlers. And um, so for me, um, you know, being indigenous, it's really important to, to be able to do this. Um, I'll give you a little background of who I am. Um, I was born here on Long Island. Um, I've pretty much grown up on Shinnecock my entire life. I, um, I've been a dancer, um, a traditional dancer since I guess I was one years old. You know. Um, my, my father and my mother had me out on the, on the dance floor, uh, the, the drum, our dance arena on Shinnecock as, as a newborn. And um, that kind of just stuck with me my entire life. Um, I'm a traditional singer. Um, I am very involved in the local community. Um, I'm an artist. Um, I sit on uh, maybe eight or nine um, committees. Um, I sit on the Southampton Town Arts and Culture Committee. Um, I sit on the Watermill Center Fellowship, Community Fellowship Committee. Um, I am co-chair of uh, Graves Protection Warrior Society, um, which is on Shinnecock. Um, I've been involved with the Natural Resources Committee on Shinnecock, the Cultural Committee on Shinnecock. Um, we also just uh, created a Southampton Town Stewardship Committee, which is involved in um, cultural sensitive sites that are in Southampton. Um, and with, it's a joint Southampton Town and Shinnecock Nation Stewardship Committee, and I'm a member of that also. Um, for most of my adult life, I guess, um, I've been very involved in my culture. Um, as a young kid, I grew up on what we call the powwow trail. And uh, powwows are celebrations um, of Native Americans where several tribes come together and, um, and dance, sing, uh, have festivities, and um, as a kid, I was going on these power trails with one of my cousins and his family, and uh, we would sell traditional foods and, and other foods going around all the New England and, and the East Coast. Um, at 16 years old, I actually created my own power stand and started traveling all around the East Coast um, selling traditional foods, and um, as I started, you know, getting me more into that, to the powwow trail, I started involving my artwork as well, uh, which some of it you can see here on the, on the table, um, you can take a better look at the end. And um, so for, for several years, um, from 16 to I guess 18 or 19, I, I traveled around the East Coast um, selling, selling artwork. And uh, I guess I picked it up again when I was about 23, selling traditional artworks. Um, and traveling not only just on the East Coast, but also up in Canada and various reservations. I would um, take my artwork as well as other people's artworks on, on Shinnecock, um, selling their, their traditional uh, work and contemporary works as well. If I was traveling to a reservation in Canada, I would also take their artworks as well. And um, in doing that, I guess I was realizing a lot of similarities um, amongst different tribes uh, along, along the way. And, um, you know, here in Shinnecock, um, our history has been very much suppressed. Um, it's, we've, we've been very oppressed culturally, physically, and um, mentally as well. And um, it started almost right at first contact. Um, in 1640, Southampton was founded, and the chief of Long Island 
um, was named Wine Dance. And he was the chief of all of Long Island. And yes, we are Shinnecock, but Shinnecock is, was just a sub-tribe of what was known as the 13 tribes of Long Island. And I call that the myth of the 13 tribes of Long Island because as history would put it, um, they make it seem like we were different countries, right? Different nationalities, when in reality we were more towns of the same state. And um, the, the way they, they made it seem was that uh, because we were different nationalities, different tribes, that it made it easier for them to purchase lands from us, um, further dividing our people. Um, so in 1640, Wine Dance was the chief of all of Long Island. And um, they say he was uh, the, the friend of the settlers, um, that he, he wanted to kind of help the settlers out. And um, that was because prior to that, what happened in uh, Connecticut was known as the Pequot Wars. And during the Pequot Wars, um, the Pequots revolted against the English and essentially were wiped out. Um, as history would put it, they were extinct, but that also wasn't true. Um, but so Wine Dance was sort of afraid, um, hesitant to go against the English at that time. And, um, but our people uh, were, were kind of hesitant also to be friends with the English as a whole. And um, eventually, because we were starting to, to revolt ourselves, Wine Dance ended up being poisoned. And um, in 1659, he was poisoned. And his son, uh, William Kalmbaum, became some, uh, sachem. That's our word for chief, sachem. And when he became uh, sachem of, of Montauk and all of Long Island, taking his heir, um, his power, uh, he was also poisoned one year into his uh, chiefdomship. And so following that, um, his wine dancer's daughter became sunksqua, our word for a woman chief. And uh, she reigned from 1662, and almost immediately when she got into uh, chieftainship, she filed a land claim. And not necessarily in the courts, um, but it was a land of complaint. Um, and the literal document says something like, uh, you know, I will sue the English and the Dutch for lands that they um, live on and occupy that uh, they did not pay for. And um, she did that in 1662, 1663. And up until 1686, that, that went un, unresolved. Um, at that point, up until 1686, Suffolk County was part of Connecticut at the time. And the head was in Hartford. And uh, when um, it finally got resolved, the way it got resolved was the governor of, um, of New York came down from Albany, Governor Donegan, and came down and um, kind of wanted to make Suffolk County part of New York. And in order to do that, he had to deem that the receipts for the lands in Suffolk County were valid. So in 1686, he came down and ruled against the Shinnecock people, Montauk people, and said that uh, all receipts are valid. And he challenged that again, and in 1703, it was finally completely just you know, brushed, brushed under the table. Um, the 1703 deed was known by Southampton Village as the panic deed uh, because they were really uh, worried that we were able to get our lands back. Um, so that, you know, fast forward to 2016, 17, I think, uh, we just recently lost a land claim in uh, Shinnecock Hills area where um, they basically said that yes, the land is stolen, but because uh, people are living on it now and because we took so long uh, that uh, there's nothing they can do about it. Um, so for us, you know, um, it was kind of a detriment to hear that, um, but we also don't see that that can be the end. Um, because what our, our point of view is that in the United States, um, Native Americans didn't have rights, any rights, up until the 1920s. And after that, we weren't citizens up until the 1920s. After that, it took until the 1970s for Native Americans to have full rights um, after what was called the American Indian Movement or the AIM Movement. And uh, what, what happened after that, well, what happened before that, we weren't allowed to speak our languages. We weren't allowed to sing those songs like I just sung or speak the language. 
um, that I just spoke. Uh, we weren't allowed to wear our traditional clothing. Uh, we had to wear English clothing um, under penalty of death, basically, under threat. Um, we had to wear English clothing. We were forced into Christianity. We were forced in to speak English. And uh, that, that uh, oppression started here in Southampton in the 1600s um, through what was called the Great Awakening. Uh, where our people, um, the, the Southampton village called it the Great Awakening, where our people were forced into the churches and forced into uh, assimilation into modern society or their society. Um, so in uh, the 70s, after the AIM movement, people were fi our people were finally able to, to express who we were, who we are. And uh, through that time, a lot has been uh, pushed underground. Um, a lot of our elders were hesitant to pass down our culture, um, especially here on the East Coast, being that we're first contact people. Uh, they were very hesitant to pass down our, our culture, our, our way of life, because they were afraid that their children and grandchildren um, would end up treated the same way that they were. And uh, one of the worst things that happened here in the Americas um, was known as the uh, residential schools. And the residential boarding schools were where uh, the United States and Canadian government would uh, go into Native American communities and uh, take the children and force them into these boarding schools. And I, I was reading one letter um, where it was like, you know, we'll, we'll, let, uh, we'll let your child come home for the holidays, uh, but only for like seven days or 10 days or something like that. And if they're late, by any means, uh, next year they won't be allowed to leave, you know. And uh, so there were Shinnecock people still alive today that remember those boarding schools. You know, they're elderly now, but they still remember that. Um, there are tribes up in Canada that it, it, those boarding schools didn't end in Canada up until the 90s. Um, it's that recent. I've met people up there that were fairly young that remember those boarding schools. Um, one of the places I went was uh, up in northern Quebec. And the only way to get to this area was uh, you go all the way to the end of the road, they call it, to a place called Satil, which is the northern border of um, the St. Lawrence River. And then from there, you take a 14-hour train ride or a plane is the only way to get to this community. And they still, prior to 70-something years ago, they had no contact with the outside world. And those people still remember life before contact with, the, with modern society and remember being taken out of the bush, as they call it, into these uh, boarding schools and into assimilation. And uh, so I got to meet those people firsthand and understand, even though for them it happened at a much accelerated, much more accelerated uh, process, you know, it was the same exact thing that happened to us over the last 300 years. Um, so that's why today, to be able to do this and stand here um, and be able to speak my language and talk to you and talk to you about who I am as a Shinnecock person is very important, you know, because less than 100 years ago, less than 50 years ago, our people weren't allowed to do this. Um, so that's it's, it's why it's very important. It's why it's also very important that uh, I sit on these committees, you know, and, and continue this outreach, you know, with the Southampton Town Arts and Culture Committee that Hope Sandro um, founded, I guess, last year, uh, two years ago. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it just feels like two years. It does, right? <laughs> a year, yeah, a year ago. And um, I'm very honored that she asked me to be a founding member of that committee um, because there was a time where that wouldn't have happened. And I'm very also honored that she asked me to open up uh, every meeting that we can in front of town hall singing that song that I just sung today. You know, So that's a very uh, an, awesome, an awesome thing to, to be a part of. Very humbling, you know, to, to know that I can do that for my ancestors and for the next generations, you know, that are that are coming up, so that we can be free, you know, that we can be who we are today. Um, so, I also want to talk a little bit about my name, um, Bishiki uh means standing buffalo, and um, there's a, a more detailed story of where that comes from, but one of the concepts of my name comes from a story that, uh, uh, well, it's part of our creation story. 
And what it says is that uh, at one point, Anishinaabe people, I mentioned in my introduction, Anishinaabe, uh, we are Anishinaabe people. Um, Anishinaabe people are Algonquian speaking people. You know, a lot of people might know that word, and a lot of people may think it means the name of the actual people, but it's actually the name of the language, and I honestly don't know where it came from. I think it was just a given, a given term for the, our language dialect. Um, which goes from Virginia all the way to northern Canada, all the way out to Minnesota, um, part of the Dakotas, I guess. And uh, what, what that uh, creation story says is that at one point, Anishinaabe people weren't living in a good way. Um, that uh, the people started to forget the, the teachings of, of how to take care of the earth, um, the teachings that the Creator originally gave our people. And um, the creator was going to, to send out the spirit of destruction because our people, they started uh, learning the teachings of war and how to fight each other. And it started off very small, just arguments between people and ended up being actual fights and then battles. And our people um, weren't living in a good way, that traditional way that was given to us by the creator. So the creator was gonna send down the spirit of destruction for the second time. Um, because the first time he did, and there was a great flood that happened. Um, and that's, that, that story is how we got our, our, our term for North America, Turtle Island. Um, but for the second time, he was going to send down the spirit of destruction again. But the eagle um, flew up and said, no, I know there's somebody out there that can, that's still uh, practicing those traditional ways, those traditional ways that you originally gave the Anishinaabe people. And um, so the creator said, okay, I'll give you four days. I'll give you four days to go out there and try and find somebody and show me that somebody out there still has those teachings. So the eagle flew and flew and flew. And for three days, the eagle um, couldn't find anybody. And he was about to give up uh, but, um, and land on the ground. And for us, when an eagle lands on the ground or when an eagle feather touches the ground, it's like losing a warrior. The eagle loses its, its sacredness, its healing powers. And when he was about to give up and land on the ground, the buffalo stepped up and said, no, land on my back and rest. You know, you have to rest and, and not touch the ground. And tomorrow you can go find that, those people that you, that you speak of. And so the eagle rested on the buffalo's back for one day and on the fourth day, he flew deep out into the woods and found one family that was, uh, still had tobacco in their hands, as they say, and uh, was practicing those traditional ways. So the eagle flew back towards the Creator and, uh, and screeched and called the Creator. And um, the Creator pulled back the spirit of destruction when the eagle came to him with that information. So in our way, we say it's the eagle and the buffalo that is standing in the western doorway because our people believe that when you're born, you come from the east, and when you die, you go west. So the eagle and the buffalo are standing in the western doorway with the eagle sitting on the buffalo's back, and the river of life flows between the buffalo's legs. And as Anishinaabe people, um, if we're living in a good way, the buffalo has the strength to stand. And uh, if we're living in a bad way, the buffalo loses its strength and falls into the, the river of life reminiscent of that story of a time where the river of life would have been ended by the creator and the spirit of destruction. So I was given that name last year um, at ceremonies out of Wisconsin. I'm an initiate of what's known as the Medewawin Lodge, the Three Fires Medewawin Lodge, which um, Medewawin means the good hearted way. And is a, um, a, I don't want to say modern, but it's based off of all of Algonquian speaking or Anishinaabe um, cultural heritage, basically. I don't want to say religion, but that's kind of what it is. It's Anishinaabe religion. And um, that, uh, that name was given to me last August at, at ceremonies out there. And my middle name um, that was given to me by my parents is Eagle, um, or Diami, which is Eagle and Hopi. So it kind of balances out, you know, that story. When I first heard that story, and I didn't fully hear that story until after that name was given to me, you know, that uh, 
the the relationship between the eagle and the buffalo in our in our creation story. Um, so today, as I um, represent Shinnecock, you know, I keep that in mind to live in a good way, uh, to live in a, in a traditional way as much as I can in this contemporary world. You know, it's, it's not easy in today's modern modern life um, to modern society to you know balance traditional ways and how to live in this modern world. You know, traditionally, you know, we would take everything from the earth and uh, only what we needed. You know, and in our way, we give, we always gave back for, for what we took. And um, today, it's not that easy. You know, it's not like on Shinnecock, you know, we can't go down the road and cut down trees to build our houses. You know, we have to have a job or have monetary values to go out and, and go out and build our houses and sustain our, our people. So there's a balance there um, that we have to figure out. And on top of that, because of colonization and oppression, we also have to balance out uh, the trauma, right? The historical trauma that our people have faced throughout history, you know, for 300 years almost, you know, that our people have faced and are just now able to even speak about it. Um, so that's something that we always have to, have to remember as people and, uh, and just, just people in general. You know, I don't mean Shinnecock people, but yeah, all of us. Um, so when I go out and I do these ceremonies, um, uh, in our way, like the ceremony I just, um, I just did at the beginning, I consider that a ceremony where I welcome you all into this space um, in my traditional territory. And uh, that's something that I, that I keep in mind, you know, is that, that history. That, that once we could not do that, you know? And so I'm also should acknowledge that the Watermill Center was the first uh, that I know of um, organization in the Hamptons to uh, like reach out and ask for a welcoming ceremony uh, by the indigenous people of this area at the, uh, the opening of the summer residency program last year. Um, I'm very honored that they reached out and Bob and Elka asked me to uh, perform the welcoming ceremony at the Watermill Center. And they really lit a fire because since then I've probably done over a hundred in there, you know, literally. Like, um, so, you know, it was really great to see that. Um, I also perform um, ceremonies uh, for beach whales. Um, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but in the last several years, we've had a lot of whales that, um, that are out in our waters. You know, there's, I, during the summer times, the last several years, I see whales, if I'm looking for them, I can see them at any given point. And um, so I, uh, when, because there's a lot of whales in our waters, there's, uh, it coincides with the beachings, uh, because the more animals that are out there, the more are also gonna die, right? So for us, traditionally, um, when a beach whale, when a, a whale washed up dead, um, our people would do a ceremony uh, for the whale, for the being. Um, our people were whalers. Um, people, our people had canoes that would go out there and, uh, and harvest these whales, and it was to sustain our people. And um, so for us today, for me today, to be able to go out there and uphold that tradition is also very uh, an honor. Um, so uh, what you're going to see here in a second after this ad, <laughs> um, at um, last summer, uh, I'm, the, I'm also the designated person that AMCS, um, I forget what it stands for, Atlantic Marine uh, Conservancy, uh, I forget what it stands for, but anyway, the people that do the necropsy of the whales um, when they wash up, they contact me directly and allow me to, to uh, access the well and, and do a ceremony for them. So I've been doing that the last several years. And um, at one point, Fox 5 asked if they could come along with me and, uh, and record and document uh, one of these ceremonies. My name is so, Shane Weeks. I'm from the Shinnecock Nation in Southampton, New York. Our people, we still come out and we acknowledge these events. 
Um, if we do a traditional ceremony, we sing a song um, in honor of the spirit of the animal, and uh, then we make an offering to the animal. I've been doing these ceremonies for the last several years um, as the whale uh, beachings increase. Um, all the way from Queens to Montauk, I've, I've been to nearly every, every whale beaching over the last several years. Whales have a, a very cultural significance to our people. In our language, we call the whale pota or Mijay pota, great whale. And the importance of the whale being the great being of the sea is able to sustain our people in, in means of nourishment, in spirit, and in, in food. A lot of people don't know, we used to have canoes that, that would hold almost 100 people that would go out there and harvest these animals in a sustainable way that would sustain us and the whales in a balance. Uh, the history of the ceremony dates back at least hundreds of years, where this first settlers here in you know, the east end of the island documented our ceremonial practices for the whale. And what it originally included was a feast that included the tail and the fins of the whale. And they would be roasted here on the beach and then eaten um, throughout the whole community. In our traditions and in our culture, there are certain things that have to be done in a certain way. You know, there are rules to what we wear, there are rules to what we do in ceremony, and um, that, that's something that's part of our tradition and how it's kept so so tight for us is that uh, when it's passed down, it's passed down exactly how it was given. Traditionally, when it's, as the whale was given to us by the Creator and by its sacrifice, by beaching itself, we also give back to it in a good way. So um, it's kind of funny how they ended up coming along with me. Uh, the day before that happened, another mink whale washed up somewhere, I guess it was Montauk or East Hampton, and um, the local papers covered that story. And uh, Fox 5 heard through, uh, I guess, through those papers and contacted me the next day. And um, when, when they called me, they were like, yeah, you know, just let us know next time you, you uh, a whale beaches. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm on my way to one right now. <laughs> and so they were like, oh, really? Okay. So uh, they're like, well, we have somebody on the North, uh, the north Shore uh, we could send out. So we ended up going, this was in Montauk, and uh, we ended up going out there, the way I'm, yeah, I'm against it. ended up going out there and, and doing this. And actually, my father came with me um, for the first time in one of these ceremonies. Which was really awesome to have him with me. Um, so, uh, just thinking of time here, I'm going to move on to my relationship with the Watermill Center. Um, I guess my first interaction with the Watermill Center was in 2014. Um, I used to work at the Shinnecock Museum, um, the cultural center on the reservation, and uh, Bob and the summer residents uh, here in in that, that summer, came out and said they wanted a tour of the reservation and of the museum. So I offered to, to show them around, and uh, it, we had a really great time. And from that, I met a couple of people, um, a film director and some sound people um, from Poland. Uh, Adam Lanza was actually from Michigan. Um, and we decided we wanted to come up with this project to go into Shinnecock and interview um, people on um, the changes, uh, what people remember. Um, you know, we interviewed everybody from, from little kids to, to elders. And we ended up um, with the most extensive documentation, of interview documentation, of Shinnecock people that uh, exist in, even to this day. Um, and we ended up with tw like 24 hours of just interview footage. And we interviewed almost 50 people, I guess. Um, so, which is really amazing, you know, to be able to do that. And one thing about that was that, uh, you know, for, for me as a Shinnecock person, I didn't learn my history in textbooks, you know, I didn't learn my history in school. I had to do a lot of research to understand my history and talk to my elders and really dig for it. And um, what I found is that the documentation that is on Shinnecock isn't told by Shinnecock people. It's told uh, through third person, uh, what people saw, and um, a lot of it is, you know, what they saw, but also what they think we were doing. You know, oh, they must be doing this ceremony because they, the devil is, you know, that's, that's usually what it says, really. <laughs> so, um, for 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 us, for me, uh, it's really important to for us to be able to tell our own stories, 
And um, also throughout that process of that first uh, residency, that residency I was a part of in uh, 2015. And uh, for us to be able to tell our own story. Um, before that though, I was, I did, it wasn't my own residency, but I was also a part of another residency with Natasha uh, Mankowski from um, Paris, uh, who actually lives in Berlin now. Um, but she was doing a project on the uh, Brooklyn uh, Navy Yard and how it's, it was getting uh, deteriorated. And how, here you have this, this uh, massive part of history, of New York history, that is kind of left you know, or unnoticed for the most part. And that kind of also is, was relevant for, and uh, less so now, um, for Shinnecock as well. Because you'd be surprised how many people, even that live here in Southampton, that don't know that there's a reservation right down the road. Um, so, you know, I, was, I, I gave a song, uh, sang a song for, for that project. I was also involved in um, several other projects um, here, Watermelon, throughout the years. Um, one of the, the most significant ones, though, for me um, was with uh, a group called El Colegio del Cuerpo, uh, which is the School of the Body from Colombia. Uh, they're based in Cartagena, Colombia, and um, run by uh, Alvaro Restrepo. And um, he created a, I believe in 2012, a ceremony um, at the request of the Colombian government to uh, commemorate 200 years of independence from Spain for Colombia. And instead of having this big celebration, um, he decided he wanted to reflect on the, as he calls, the undeclared 500-year-old undeclared civil war, civil conflict that's going on in Colombia. And so instead of um, having the celebration, he called the ceremony Ingzile, or uh, he called it Ingzile, the Trail of Tears, which means um, being exiled within your own territory or your own country. And uh, he performed that three times, um, one in Cartagena, uh, the second in Medellin, and the third in Bogota. And the second one in Medellin, uh, the Colombian president actually took, took part in the ceremony. And what the ceremony consisted of was, you know, the original ceremony was about 200 um, participants. And uh, I guess it was almost about 100 of them were, were an orchestra, a live orchestra. Then the other 100 and, and change was um, actual uh, victims of those civil conflicts, um, displaced people, um, people that lost people. And the, there were officiants that were set up on the stage or in the area, in the space. Uh, like town officials, one that second time it was the president of Colombia. And they were able to tell their story directly to these people um, so that they could listen. And so it was his idea. He reached out to the Waterville Center, um, to um, Nixon, uh, who's not here tonight, but Nixon, uh, I can't remember his last name. Beltran, yeah. And um, Nixon put me in contact with Alvaro, and we decided that we wanted to um, make a ceremony that reflected Ingzao for Shinnecock, and uh, talk about being displaced in our own territory. So uh, through conversation, we decided that I needed to go down to Colombia to see the, the similarities between um, Colombia and Shinnecock, and Cartagena and Shinnecock, and specifically um, the wealth versus the uh, and um, so, which is the same for us, you know, most of Shinnecock history, we were very uh, poor. Um, uh, even in my lifetime, I, we didn't have street water until uh, I was, you know, a teenager, I guess, almost. And <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, I still was remember. Well yeah, it was well water. Yeah. <laughs> but still, the entire reservation did not have sh street water up until that time. You know, and there was there was a lot of, uh, of poverty on the reservation. Um, and in Colombia, when I went down there, you know, you'd have these multi-million dollar hotels and infrastructure, and then literally, you know, the other side of this room it would be swamps um, with huts, and the people would be living in these huts, and the bottom, the floors would be uh, water, the swamp. You know, so it was that contrast. And so I spent 11 days down there in Cartagena. I visited his school, um, uh, which is really awesome, what he's doing down there. Um, 
and gave two presentations, one for the staff of El Colegio and one for the uh, students that were there. And uh, from there, we came here and we um, involved several Shinnecock people to create this ceremony. Um, we called it Inxile, the, good, uh, the Voice of the Good Neighbors, which is that second part is what I came up with. Um, because as a child, I always heard uh, from a lot of our, the elders back then, saying, you know, we have to be good neighbors, you know, so that way we don't get more oppression, right? We don't get oppressed even more. So we have to be good neighbors with the town's focus on Hampton. And uh, so in, in respect to that, I came up with that name, the voice of the good neighbors. So here you'll see a, a, a compilation of, of the ceremony that took place here at the Waterville Center. Prior to this, we also did one on the reservation. The creator gathered all of creation and said, I want to hide something from the humans until they are ready for it. It is the realization that they create their own reality. The eagle said, give it to me. I will take it to the moon. The creator said, no. One day they will go there and they will find it.
everything the power of the world does is done in a circle. The sky is round, and I have heard that the earth is round like a ball, and so are the stars. The wind in its greatest power whirls. Birds make their nests in circles, for theirs is the same religion as ours. The sun comes forth and goes down again in a circle. The moon does the same, and they both are round. ourselves in a contemporary way, um, but also holding true to our traditions and um, expressing ourselves in that manner. Um, for a lot of people in Shinnecock, you know, that something like that had never been done, or uh, um, people had never, never been exposed to that kind of uh, artistic work on the reservation. And it was particularly uh, powerful um, during the ceremony on the reservation itself. Um, which was a much more intimate space uh, in our community center there. And um, as you can see, a, a lot of people uh, that are in the crowd were also a part of that ceremony. Um, but, uh, you know, today a, a couple of the projects that I'm working on have to do with um, more, more outreach uh, of our people. Um, you know, as I said, I sit on nine committees. And that's a full-time job in itself, so, but in my spare time, I do try and find time to, to work on these projects. Um, one of them uh, that I'm working on right now is a film project. And um, I just recently started getting into film myself, photography and film. Um, and uh, we're working on a project uh, with one of my cousins here, um, the cameraman, <laughs> and, uh, and another group of people. Um, that I'm working with, we're working with. And uh, we're going to try and do like a mini documentary series of, um, of Shinnecock. And um, the idea for the beginning of it is for me to be a host. And um, I don't know, for some reason, people seem to think I, I just go on these great adventures every day. So <laughs> <laughs> the idea is for them to, um, to follow me around in my daily life, um, going to, to, to do these ceremonies or out in, out in the world. And, nature, giving these presentations, um, just expressing who we are as a people. And um, so we've been working on that um, pretty much the last month, like intensely. And, um, but uh, before that, I just, just uh, played around with editing and, and photography and film and came up with this um, short clip, um, which is my first editing work. Um, it's also my first film work. Um, and bear with it a little bit, the, most of it, a uh, good portion of it is very low in volume when I'm talking, but I uh, hope you enjoy. Self-talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bishop Keen, the Bowen, the Dust Reese. Bishop Keen, the Oden. A synagogue, what you 
My name is Standing Buffalo. My name comes from the story of a journey westward. I am Shinnecott. We bear the spirits of our ancestors before us. We walk the same shore as they did. We have endured here on this island for many thousands of years. And here we remain. that long ago that we weren't even a 
celebration here today is an honor for our ancestors, I think. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's something that our ancestors fought for and died for. You know, generations of our ancestors fought and died for it and never saw it. And um, so today, to be able to, to talk about this publicly and talk about this to people who are actually willing to listen to it, it's a huge, huge, huge accomplishment. So, um, yeah, that that footage. Uh, the I'm sound. creating a Wix site. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Please pause for this break. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I filmed most of that last summer, and then actually put it together um, until about a month or a month and a half ago. And when I realized that the sound wasn't um, loud, I just didn't. I didn't want to go through having to re-record. <laughs> so <laughs> I just left it as it was. Um, all that footage was um, filmed by me, um, and a little inside scoop. Um, during that interview, nobody else was there. I was just talking to <laughs> <laughs> talking to the grass. <laughs> um, and also, uh, this footage, right? I mean, this um, photo it was taken by Jeremy Dennis during the um, uh, ceremony here at the Waterhouse Center, the welcoming ceremony. Um, most of these. The rest of the images that aren't of me, I took myself. Um, I also made, uh, this is part of my regalia here. Um, I made all of that uh, in, a, in a traditional way. Um, and most of the stuff that's on the table there, um, you'll see a drum, you'll see a rattle, um, a war club, a leather bag, um, the cane, the beaded cane I didn't make. Um, and also on the front there, you'll see a few uh, arrowheads that I found here in the Hamptons, um, most of them on the beaches. One of them I did find in uh, the roots of an uprooted tree. Um, but you can take a look at those as you walk around at the end. Um, also on the end, on the left side, um, is an article that I wrote um, that was published in the uh, Southampton Press um, about the Sikaja. And um, they published it right around the anniversary of the Sikajan shipwreck, which was a uh, shipwreck that happened in Bridgehampton in 1876. And 10 Shanghai men were lost um, during that, that time, that shipwreck. And uh, it was a very pivotal moment in history for Shanghai and for Southampton. And that, that article is about that. Um, feel free to take pictures of it so you can read it in its entirety later. Um, and if you want to take a look uh, on this side is our dictionary, our language dictionary. Um, with the Shinnecock language being the primary words in that dictionary. Um, so I'd just like to thank everybody for coming out, and uh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to, uh, should I want to open this question? Yeah, hold on, hold on. There we go. Uh, thank everyone for coming out. Um, Without Shane, I wouldn't be here. Without his um, involvement and being so active in the community. I don't think I introduced myself in the beginning, but I'm Kelly Dennis, and I'm also a member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation, and maybe you saw me, there I am again. Um, <laughs> a little bit in the slide, and also in the video that uh, was played earlier with Alvaro Restrepo and El Colegio del Cuerpo, um, when uh, they were looking for um, uh, Shinnecock community members to come take place in the ceremony. Uh, they needed an orator and dancers. I was like, I could do that. Um, and came to Watermill and just fell in love with the place. And I haven't been able to escape. Um, so now I am the public programs and residency coordinator here at the Watermill. <laughs> and yeah, so we have. Uh, um, where we open it up to uh, questions, if you have any comments about what you saw, any, um, anything you, you want to discuss with Shane. Um, you mentioned
mentioned you were quite curious and that's how you got to know your culture deeper. How do you sustain it with the younger members of your family? I was just asking, um, Shane said he was curious and had to search about his traditions. How do they translate to the younger generation their traditions? Are they too curious or do you give them that gift? Um, well, right now we do have a uh, preschool on the reservation. Um, and our language is currently um, being taught at the preschool. Um, our cultural uh, values are also being taught at the preschool. Um, also, a lot of it is just through word of mouth, and uh, when somebody feels that they're ready to want to reach out and, and uh, understand our culture a little better, um, they can reach out to, to several people on the reservation that uh, can give them that insight. Um, so for me, you know, it was, um, I, I heard a little bit here and there, and uh, as I said, a lot of our history went underground, and uh, a lot of it wasn't talked about. And even our language, at one point, I remember a lot of elders said, you know, oh, there was only 10 words that were saved, you know, in our language. But come to find out, our language was completely documented um, because the first Bible um, that was translated uh, from English into Algonquian was done in the Shinnecock dialect. Um, Kelly? Yep. No sound. No sound. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, So when, when that uh, happened, um, it was done by a guy named Kokono, and uh, the Reverend John Elliott translated um, the, that first Bible. And uh, Kokono was a Shinnecock person that was captured during the Pequot War, and uh, ended up a slave um, that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that ended up a slave and uh, ended up with Kokono translating that Bible. And that's the entire dictionary right there and that's based off of that Bible. It also has a, a compilation of other people's works from other tribes in New England, but the primary words are Walsh and Tonkers. And that's something I had to dig for to find out, you know, because growing up, a lot of people would say, you know, oh, there's only 10 words, but, you know, that's hundreds. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Shane, I've got a question. You've talked about the history tribe and nothing is there. Are you having a project whereby that is now done, that you are writing the history, and that someone is writing the history, and the stories, for all that is what goes from mouth to mouth, is otherwise lost. So is anyone doing that, or are you working on that? Um, I, I am currently working on a book uh, that talks about a lot of our history and a lot of our culture, um, but a lot of it also isn't appropriate to be written. Um, a lot of it, our, our Traditional culture is all oral, um, except for um, there are certain scrolls that have pictures that could be read only by certain people. Um, so a lot of our tradition is only oral, and that's just how it, it, it will remain until uh, until somebody breaks that rule. You know, should, that should record it. Yeah, well, e even even that, it's it's a lot of it has to be heard um, in person. Um, but there is a lot that that can be uh, talked about as well without getting too technical into the actual um, stories. Uh, but um, it's, it's being worked on, it is. And to, to that point, um, a lot of what I know about Shinnecock also, I wouldn't know if it wasn't written down, you know, like, like the language, you know. So there's that balance there as well in this, this, in this modern society and keeping those traditional values um, intact. So there's always a balance there. That's a good point. Will we be able to see any of the interviews that you have been doing? Yeah, we, we hope to um, use those interviews in the project we're working on now, um, as well as the original documentary that was going to be made with that, those interview footage. Um, but uh, we hope to do that. We will have those in there. It's part of the archive, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's not public yet. Of the 13 original tribes under one game, um, so right now there's two uh, reservations on Long Island, um, ours and the Uncachug people that live on the Puspatuck Reservation in Mastic. Um, they have about 55 acres. We have um, 1,000 acres right at the edge of the village and 90 acres in Hampton Bays. Um, 
there are um, people that still survive though that are not recognized by any government, um, but uh, like Montauk people, right? You know, they're, they're currently trying to gain a recognition, state recognition. Um, so there are people there that uh, descend from Montauk people. Um, even myself, I have uh, Montauk lineage, Uncle Chuck lineage. Um, and then there's uh, Matinecock people, uh, Setauket people um, that are still alive and can trace their, their heritage back. Setauket is like uh, Stony Brook. Uh, Matinecock is uh, Oyster Bay area um, and more towards the city there. Um, and I think I'm missing one, but those are those are the ones that are more prevalent today. Hope. I think everybody here would be happy to hear about your work to preserve the remains of the um, elder that was found mm -hmm. in our neighborhood of Shinnecock Hill. Mm -hmm. Do you think yeah. you should tell them how you're working for the town to, to get recognition for the future, too? Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, I'm um, co-chair of what's called the Graves Protection Warrior Society. And um, I recently became co-chair in the last year. Uh, I've been a part of it for two years, and it's, the society has been around for about 25 years. And um, its, it's uh, purpose, its mission, is to preserve and protect um, burial grounds that are found on Long Island. And um, especially when remains are uncovered uh, during development. And um, our purpose is to try and either protect it from it not happening or further desecration or to put those remains back in the ground um, when they were repatriated from museums and other places. So in August last year, um, remains were uncovered in uh, Shinnecock Hills um, on Hawthorne uh, Avenue. And um, a skull, a few leg bones, and a uh, bottle was, was taken out the ground. And uh, various protection um, negotiated with the town for them to, um, for CPF, uh, Cultural Preservation uh, Foundation or Fund, um, put up $450,000 um, to help purchase that land. Um, the tribe, Graves Protection, and Pecanic Land Trust put up another $50,000 for the site restoration. And um, right now it's currently being, in, it's currently in the process of closing. Um, so we're just waiting to hear the finalization of that. Um, and once that happens, uh, that will also fall under that stewardship committee, that South Hampton Town Stewardship Committee um, between Shinnecock and South Hampton Town uh, for us to, to have stewardship over that burial site. And there are many others in South Hampton that we know about. It's also, that's one of those things that's also very important. It's one thing in, in the case of Hawthorne where there was a lot of media coverage um, and a lot of people present that saw where, where the remains were at the time. But when we do know that there are remains somewhere, um, it's also important for us to keep those, those locations private um, because that, that is another way our people have been erased out of history as well. You know, if you find remains somewhere, it's proof that we were there, and therefore it's proof that we have um, claim to that land. Um, so a lot of the times, those, those areas are just destroyed and kept secret. Um, so for us, you know, we keep it as secret as possible until we have no choice but to say, uh, you know that that's our people, you know, in the case of Hawthorne. Um, other times, it, in Riverhead, it had a lot of media coverage. Um, in Indian Island, Shelter Island, uh, there have been remains there. But we know of, of several burial grounds currently that, uh, in public already, just that we know through oral history where these locations are. And uh, hopefully there'll never be a day where we have to, you know, uh, say, you know, identify them out of the ground. But uh, if, if that does happen, we're prepared. We have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not really clear on how you are preserving the culture that so much of it has been lost. You said that you have a tremendous amount of interviews that you've accomplished. And I think I heard you say that a lot of the culture is actually very private, very, uh, it's not really meant for us to 
participate in. And my question is that there is such a wealth of excellent documentarians out here. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there any way you can use that talent to help you in recording your history, which I, I understand is mostly oral. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I guess I'd never see it, but I mean, is there, is there some way to use the talent that's out here to, to help you get this stuff captured yeah. in, in, that, in a format that's something we do hope to do. Um, but like I said, you know, there are certain... And he's good. <laughs> so, um... But I mean, you know, yeah. there's, there's so much to know. But yeah, it ha and it has to be done in a way that um, is still... It's, it's appropriate for us, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, they, like when I gave that story about my name, there are a lot parts of that story that I just left out that I won't say in public, right? So, but if, if a Shinnecock person listening to that in the future wants to know more about that, it, and I can pass that down in the future orally to that Shinnecock person, at least there's breadcrumbs for them to follow in the future. You know, so that's kind of the, the basis of, of being able to to express that, right? You know, in, a, in an appropriate way. Thank you. So, thank you. So, if you have any other questions, I'll be around for a little while. <laughs> so, thank you all for coming out.